Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to this really exciting discussion. My name is Michelle Miller. I am the Director of Innovation at the Center for Labor and the Just Economy. And uh, my colleague, Sharon Block, who's the Executive Director of the Center for Labor and the Just Economy, are excited to welcome SEIU and SEIU members in home care and child care and members of Drivers Demand Justice to Harvard Law School for this discussion. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the lives of working women as a way of kicking off International Women's Month. And it's especially exciting to join with SEIU at a moment when we have so much to celebrate in the labor movement. Last month, 20,000 student workers voted to join SEIU in California, while in the same state of California, fast food workers won a standards board and minimum pay. Last week, Starbucks baristas won a framework for contract negotiation after two years of the company holding out. And this week, 13,000 janitors, security guards, nursing home workers, and public works employees, alongside teachers, authorized strikes in a week of action in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. It's a really exciting moment in the labor movement. And so many parts of these movements have been led by working class women, and specifically working class women of color, who know how important it is to root their movements, not just in economic wins, but also in movements for racial and gender justice. And one of the other things that all of these women have in common is that they have been organizing in industries that require a lot of creativity and a lot of innovation. Because we know that labor law has been structured to lock a lot of folks out of the benefits and protections of collective bargaining agreements. And in those circumstances, we can't just throw up our hands and say, well, too bad. We have to find new ways to organize. And so what I'm really excited about today in this conversation is hearing from workers in childcare from local 509 in Massachusetts who've been organizing in that sector, workers in home care from 1199 United Healthcare Workers East who've been organizing in home care, and members of Drivers Demand Justice who've been organizing in the gig economy. And all of these workers are working in industries where they're spread across multiple different places, they don't have a central work site, they are often alone in their jobs, and they have to find one another and build solidarities in ways we might never have thought of before. But it is in that solidarity that we're able to advance our interests in a more holistic way and build our communities. And so I am very excited to get this conversation going um, and for me to stop talking. Um, <laughs> and so I'm going to turn it over to Mary Kay Henry, who's going to set the table for our discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks to Michelle Miller and to Sharon Block. We're really excited to be here today at Harvard with these bold women uh, who are on the front lines of creating the next American labor movement that's going to include everybody, uh, which means we have to write new rules. Uh, the home care workers that we are going to hear from all across our union were not considered employees and had to struggle for decades in order to create authorities that became the employer and allowed uh, workers to organize. And so legislation was passed and we're gonna hear from a Dynamo home care leader um, that's gonna talk about that, like childcare providers who were excluded under current labor law and had to find a way uh, to create a path to collective bargaining and a new standard of living for child care providers that still needs to improve, yeah. just like it does for home care providers. And then we're really proud to work with the IAM here in Massachusetts to make it clear that Uber and Lyft need to come to their senses mm -hmm. and uh, recognize the union that the workers are demanding. And we're going to hear from incredible leaders on the front lines of that fight. These are examples of how workers have shattered ceilings to win better pay, uh, safer working conditions, and above all, dignity and respect on the job uh, in some of the toughest workplaces in our country. And so I'm proud to turn it next to Sharon. Yep. Um, this incredible um, 
creative leader that has been an amazing assistance to the entire American labor movement and to working people in finding new ways to create worker power, challenge corporate power, and uproot the systemic white racism that stands in our way of justice and inclusion. Thanks, Thank Sharon. you, Mary Kay. So the first thing we want to do is just get to know all of you who are here with us. We're so honored to have you. So if you could, we could just go down the line and if, if you guys could introduce yourselves, what union you're from, what your, um, what your role is, what your job is, and then we'll get into talking about some of the, the pressing issues that face you guys. Okay. Mary David from Chelsea, Massachusetts, Pro member of 1199 SEIU, delegate, and in the bargaining team. I'm a little bit of everything in the union. <laughs> I could say that. Awesome. So I like to take care of my clients. So that's why I'm here and I like to fight because I like to win. Clients, I have no doubt, are lucky to have you. Thank you. OK, it's me. <laughs> um, my name is Ann Osula. And, um, <laughs> <Five or nine. laughs> so boldly written. So I am I'm in child care. I happen to have to be in both uh, family child care and center. I think my center is the first um, pilot program for this, that five or nine worked on to get for us to assist the um, parents. I am in the beginning team, also in COPE and um, I am the vice president for Family Child Care in the union. Wonderful. Betty? Uh, my name is Bethlen Sakai. I'm a driver and also an organizer from Dorchester uh, for the Driver Demand Justice Coalition. I am uh, organizing for the Machinist Union. Uh, my name is Daniela Polanco. I am a driver and also an organizer for the 32BJ and trying to fight for justice. <laughs> awesome. OK, so I'm going to start, Mary Kay, with you. Um, we're here today to talk about rewriting the rules. So what exactly does that strategy mean for worker organizing in particular? for workers in the labor movement or who are trying to be part of the labor movement? Well, the current uh, law that exists for workers at this table that organize is either public law that operates by states or private law that is called the National Labor Relations Act. When the National Labor Relations Act was voted into existence in the 30s, it wrote out workers who did home care work, who did childcare work. It didn't even know in the 1930s <laughs> that Uber, Uber and Lyft would exist. Yeah. Uh, and so the law doesn't cover any of these workers' ability to organize. So it's almost like writing new rules in, in a way that we've struggled on state by state um, and ultimately need to change at the federal level but that's why what the rideshare drivers are trying to do right now in Massachusetts is so pivotal for um, Uber and Lyft drivers, rideshare drivers, and all gig workers nationally. Excellent. All right, I wanna, I'm always fascinated to know how people get started. I mean, you guys all I know are hardworking people who have to like put long hours in just to take care of yourself, take care of your families. And yet you have chosen to take on these additional um, responsibilities and leadership roles. So what inspired you to start organizing? Well, what inspired me to start organizing is like I start working in a nursing home before and then I say the nursing home closed and then I say, okay, I need to take care of my client by myself to mm -hmm. go give that love that I have. Because my kids always say, mommy, stop hugging, stop kissing. <laughs> so I go and give that love to the client. So. I start giving that love to client, and then I start calling people to get involved. 
calling people that like we need to start not work. It's okay to work in the hospitals and nursing home, but it's good to take care of clients inside the house. So I like to organize with people to take care, to talk to them, to know how to organize and how to take care of the clients more better mm -hmm. and how to organize too, to go to the ladies letters, to go and fight for more money too. Mm -hmm. So it's two kind of organizing, <laughs> organizing for the money, for the budget and organizing to take care of the client and give them a better living in their own homes. Uh -huh. And you may you started with one, but then shifted to the other. Mm -hmm. So for me, I love taking care of my client. So I give my client all the love. Uh -huh. So I expect that all the caregivers give that love to that client. Uh -huh. Because if they open the house for you, that means that they care about you uh -huh. and the care that you're going to give that client inside the house. And what inspired you to, to sort of take on that additional role? I I think is I, I want to say something that I, I just do, I love doing. I don't know, because um, previously before relocating to the country 20 something years ago, I lectured French in college in Nigeria. And I was organizing students. Yeah. I was forming some clubs like circle club. French, whatever, things like that. And when I got here, I worked in a hospital system for seven years. And um, they first closed the unit and they put me to just, I don't think they have space for me, so they put me to go around. And one night I was feeling so sick, I drove myself there and I said, I'm going to call out, but um, I don't feel well. And they, they let me go. They didn't keep me. Mm -hmm. And um, oh. I sued them. <laughs> <laughs> I sued them, and everybody was like, no, they have the right to hire and fire. I said, no, they don't. They have to fire me when I did something. I have over 200 um, unused hours for, for me to sit time. So mm -hmm. they, this, they were trying to play fast one. They cut the checks, almost how many checks. They said, oh, we don't want your taxes to be big. So they gave me the checks in a little bit. I said, give me a letter that you fired me. They said, no, if I said, I need unemployment. They say, well, we organized that for you. We'll be able to, and they did. So I enjoyed the unemployment for some time, I kept traveling. And then when I, after I went, I'm like, no, I need to sue them. So they settled out of court. Yeah, and then I was bored. I said, I'm like, what do I do? Then I called the Department of Early Education. He said, how do I open a daycare? I never knew who opened one before. Oh, okay. And do I have kids? They went to a regular public school. And I, I started my daycare in um, mm -hmm. 2012. And that's the first one. And immediately I entered this, I know that there was um, <laughs> organization going on. And I just joined. And that's how I ended up. The president, Selena pull me around when she's going she's like oh this is about then you want to be part of it I say yes and her too she's always calling on me you want to be in this I say, yes <laughs> i'm always saying yes because i love i love the organizing part of it <laughs> i love and when we go at the beginning i was in the system um my daycare was in the system and after a while i'm i'm no i'm no more i wasn't with them in the system and i decided to do the centers and I started with the one center while working on one center that is well supported by SCIU. I think that's the baby they created that because I wanted just a center and they put me in. So, oh no, you need to do it like this is going to be maybe the first organizing center that will bring union well, uh -huh. into it. So mm -hmm. I said, oh yeah, why not? And we got that going and then got the second one in Brockton, which is. In, I might put that into it too, but for now, we have the one in Boston. And um, it's a special space because um, parents um, get to come in. Um, they get to come in early. And um, um, the care that works is partner and the pilot for uh, the care that works. A lot of um, SCIU members and organizations are part of that pilot program. 
when we opened, it's, it's filled up quickly. Just that the only thing is that the basement had not to egress, so I have to classroom there. I need to put the sprinkler system in order to get the children. But they call every day. I didn't know parents were ready to drop their kids off as early as 5 a.m. Wow. They were ready because, and we work, um, that place serves uh, parents uh, uh, in um, um, carpenter and construction workers and hospital workers. Yeah. So they start work very early. Mm -hmm. So great. that is really helpful for them. And I love that I'm, you were able to give that service to parents like that. It's so meaningful to them. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Betty, what What's inspired me? you? Uh, what inspired actually when Uber and Lyft started in Massachusetts was in 2013. That's when we I started driving where there was not even your phone GPS at that mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. And we use even they test us how we even know that city and the business was very good there was a service called the black car or the, the luxurious mm -hmm. uh, uber x didn't exist that time so we started with this luxury cars like lincoln and i was a driver i liked it so i added another car so mm -hmm. another driver can rent it so with everything going on good and they started the Uber X, so our business started going down. So we kind of got not only they are in the city, the fact that we pay special for the airport pickups, it's only the livery plates. What that means is you have a one million liability insurance, which is very expensive. It is to give you numbers at about six to seven thousand a year for one car. So in order to have two cars. So it's only us who was working in the limo pool was. So when UberX comes in the, in the airport, that's when we kind of started as drivers, as Uber Black drivers, because we were few, uh -huh. uh, started um, a little Viber group there. So to say who is, so we kind of started to trick the system saying, let's all put off because they didn't have the queue system back then. Uh -huh. So we put all off. And then once it starts surging in the Viber, we will talk, oh, you can go next. You can go next, put it on your app. Uh -huh. So that's kind of, <laughs> drivers are smart. <laughs> oh, wow. So that's how it started because the UberX was like, it's cheaper for them, for the clients, mm -hmm. so they don't need to call Uber Black wow. unless yeah. they are here for a conference. But with all that was still, it's harder to organize because uh, the way the system itself, the Uber and Lyft, you know, when you call a rally here, Uber will put out a big surge so the driver will turn off and go for the surge. So <laughs> it's harder to organize. Mm -hmm. uh, it was absolutely okay, but until about really put me in and the organizing on 2016, they sent me a ride. It was with a dog. I mm -hmm. asked the rider if they want to put it on the lap because my Uber black car is fur, if it shades, you know, <laughs> and for some reason, the customer got upset, so it starts cursing and everything. So over the phone, so I said, "You better get another ride," and I canceled it because our rating also to drive an Uber Black. There are so many tensions. Okay, <laughs> our rating matters to drive an Uber Black. So if your rating goes a little down from four point nine, you cannot give us that service. So I say I canceled it. <laughs> then my account is closed. Not only me as a driver, but the account I had a livery plate is closed that the other driver also mm. can drive for other for oh, other but car, not but not mm -hmm. for me. My account like done for both my cars. So that's when it really was aggravating. And then I can still drive for Lyft and I'm still driving for Lyft. But that was the end of it. Nobody talks to you. Uh, they only send you a message which says this is a decision is final. I we know it's upsetting, but the decision is final. 
and nobody talks to you, uh, even saying, showing that if I am the driver and mm -hmm. the other cars, that doesn't matter. So I, start, I, I started looking for anything, for lawyers, for any organ. That's how I found out in Facebooks. I joined any any groups <laughs> to get, kind of get uh, help. So finally, I got to this I, IDG, the Independent Drivers Guild in New York, uh, who really did good work in uh, New York. So they started organizing. So it was the machinist, and then then it comes. So since they were here, I was there. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's how You're I started. <laughs> Uh, Daniela. Well, um, I start uh, thinking on, you know, starting this extra thing about being like after like, I'm sorry, I'm kind of nervous. No, okay. But like, what motivates what motivate me um, to take this step was um, I saw what the 32BJ did for my husband. He used to work for a company, a cleaning company. And um, they really take care of their clients. They really, you know, they're there for them. They had a voice. And since I have been driving for over like about 10 years, seven to 10 years, um, and they have, you know, it was good at the beginning. Then, you know, they get, they got like a little uh, greedy and, um, they start cutting our payments and so i i was my, one of my sisters worked for the 32bj and i asked her like you know can you guys like organize for us <laughs> and you know try to represent us she's like i think they already doing that mm -hmm. and so i got connected with um somebody on the union and since i have like this bunch of friends that we always on a call uh driving uber so i was trying to you know motivate them to get you know present say present on the um union um the 32 bj um actions that we did mm -hmm. and that was you know something that motivates me like um having a voice having somebody to represent us and um seeing how, how the union you know give you that power back again these big companies that's great that's so interesting it's your Husband's still a 32BJ member? He is working for Uber currently. Wow. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so we have two organizers <laughs> in the family now. I get it. I get what's going on. Excellent. Um, as, as Michelle and Mary Kay alluded to, this is International Women's Month. So I'm just curious if you could share with us or what are some of the particular challenges that you have faced organizing just in general, but then particularly as women in your industries. I mean, two of you come from sectors that are predominantly women. I think Uber drivers, it seems like it's the percentage is growing, but maybe not predominantly women yet. But I'm just curious, as you've undertaken these, um, these organizing campaigns, where are those challenges coming from and how do you think about it as your pers particular perspective as women in organizing? And maybe Anne, this time we'll start with you. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Um, in the case of child care, um, if you work with a system, it's like you can't talk about organizing by, except you go behind one. Mm. Uh, so, but recently, most of the women or most of the child care providers are happy to join because they've been seeing the wins. They mm -hmm. see that a lot of win the win before they're like, oh, okay, you guys fight for the money, we get it. But <laughs> now but it's hard for you to combine, especially when you are um, a family child care provider, you are um, educator in the classroom, you are the business person. You are also the person who does the purchasing. Everything is on you. So because of that, sometimes some people just have a small, very small business. It's just six children and you alone. Um, by the time you go to eight and um, 10, you need another teacher. But the mm -hmm. teacher might not be able to stay without you. So 
um, sometimes it's hard for them to take time off. But now with um, having virtual and um, when the meetings are going on, we're able to um, combine to in person and online. Mm -hmm. and that's been helpful. But apart from that, uh, 509 has particularly been very, well, I think I'm, I've been lucky to be the teams that are very hardworking and always fighting. And so when we go for the barrio, we put it on like half three. So we're able to um, have time to organize. But personally, um, for me, I I think I, I just enjoy doing what I'm doing. So mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, anytime they put it, I don't really I travel, mm -hmm. I, I I go, I just get a teacher to cover me and I even when I had my family daycare alone mm -hmm. and now that I have and if you are I believe that anything you do make it a standard and work hard and the people um, kind of maybe um, a leader, I practice leadership that I'm hands on and I say do as I do. I don't really do as I say. So <laughs> it's, been, uh, it's been working for me that way. Danielle, you want to go next? Well, I think a challenge we face um, every day is getting, you know, people to come together because sometimes. Um, we need that extra motivation to actually, you know, stay present and to show up and to fight for their rights. Uh, sometimes, you know, they have the they they have the desire, they have you know the they have motive why to fight, but like sometimes they need that little push, like you know, we can't do it together, we can't do it, and I think that's the challenge we face every. Just to keep people believing that they can do it, that you can Yeah, like coming win. together, showing up for themselves, fighting for themselves, believing that we can do it together. Mary? Well, I could say us in the union 1199 is like mostly we are a lot of women. Mm -hmm. So we are a bunch of more women than men. So, uh -huh. so when we organize or when we go to the bargaining team, it's like when myself come in inside there, he, they see a lot of bunch of women inside there and we're ready to fight and we're ready to talk <laughs> and we're ready to bargain. Uh -huh. We're ready to just, to them to listen and to us to listen to them. So we've been winning a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm so happy. I'm so proud of 1199 of us because I'm 1199 too. Right. So. <laughs> so it's like from 10, 10 45, I think it is, we win a pack for $25 the hour. So we were bargaining for the first time in history. Mm -hmm. We bargaining is always three months. But this time the bargaining was when? The seven months. Wow. So, because you know, we was changing office. Uh -huh. So my heli come in, so we wanted to get that money. <laughs> so if we wasn't going to stop until we get the money, if we really get the money. Uh -huh. So we always organize in a good way that we we women, and now we're trying to organize the guys. <laughs> they, they, they come more to speak because mm -hmm. it's always just the ladies just speaking and speaking and speaking and speaking. I say it's time for you all to they just they, they come in and, and talk too because it because some men have good stories. Uh -huh. Sometimes men go better story than us. So we really like to fight. We really get like to get good money. So we like to bargain and we like to get money and we really <laughs> win this money. And that's what I had to say. Excellent. Thank you. Patty? All right. Is the question hard to organize or? Or, or what or are the job itself? Like, yeah, what are the challenges? In like, organizing? Yeah. Okay, as, as, as she said, it, it's harder for drivers. Mm -hmm. Drivers, if they are off of the road, that means they don't have mm -hmm. any paycheck coming in. Mm -hmm. So in order for a driver to get to 
get him to come to ours is a really sacrifice. Of course we get it, you have to sacrifice something in order to get what you want, but there are drivers who really do cash out right away after they do, for example, five, six rides, mm -hmm. and they do put gas or they do grocery, just it might be a must for them yeah. to really work. So it's harder for the drivers to come together, stop work. And, and also we have seen it a couple, two, three times, whenever we announce some kind of rally coming up, uh -huh. Uber and Left is doing something. Either they, the last rally we were just talking about, the last rally we had one a week ago in the Uber office, just after we started sending flyers to drivers, the drivers who are deactivated gets an email saying, you can come anytime, we are here for you. <clears throat> and the day of the rally, so many drivers got an adjustment of $200 or something. Like It's like giving a little, <laughs> a little candy and trying to bribe the, the drivers. And as I said, there were surge prizes when you want to organize a rally, so like so, road, yeah. when they see that surge price, they want to go work mm -hmm. instead because they always think, and they have seen it in California mm -hmm. uh, and everywhere that Uber is winning always. So mm -hmm. they think the money will talk. Hey guys, you will never ever win Uber mm -hmm. because they're big. But we are really making a change. I think it's yeah. going to down the road. It's going to go easier. I'm sorry, Sharon. Were you asking also about the particular challenges of women? Of women, uh, yeah, um, absolutely. With the sort like of as a mother. Theme. Is it <laughs> like as a mother yeah. being like a yeah, Uber driver? It's yeah. challenging. It's challenging. Yeah. Like for example, like I have to work um, certain hours that they're not really busy on Uber. Mm -hmm. You know, like for example, I have to drop off my kids and I have to work on school hours, which is not really busy. Mm -hmm. um, as you can see, that's a challenge. Yeah, being a mother, trying to organize also like splitting your time, you know, between work, things in the house, and also like getting people to come together. Right, and then putting this extra time in to do, to do the organizing. Yeah, especially being a woman really, and driving with Uber and organizing is, is a, because as she said, we work around our kids' schedule, mm -hmm. and you are the mother who supports, you have to be there for your kids and there are days we go out because we're not doing the rush hour that means you're not making money. Mm -hmm. you barely make your expense mm -hmm. so in order to kind of win that there are days we go out after they sleep and work that until mm -hmm. 2 a.m and come back just sleep for four hours as, and then pack a lunch and do all those women stuff to do. And, you know, on top of this, all this too, as a woman, it's very hard with bathrooms and everything. Uh, it's not an easy job. <laughs> well, and I could say something inside of that yeah. too. Being a mom too, I was single mom with three kids, but now I'm happy. My two boys already gone. Now I get how they, my baby, she's 21. I still tell her my baby, but it was hard for me to be dealing with her, going to school, high school and everything. But I'm very, I'm a proud mom. And May, she going to graduate from Harvard. So wow. I'm so proud. So it's like working so hard, taking care of clients, and making sure my daughter is fine and my daughter's doing good. So mm -hmm. I'm very proud that I'm going to be going to DC for she graduation in December oh, and May. So awesome. but that doing what I'm doing, caring for my client and caring for my kids, help me because you just have to do the balance. Mm -hmm. They have to take care of your family, how to take care of their clients at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, I think in my own field, um, I would say 90, 90%, let me not go too high, are women. So, yeah. And um, the, there's more demand for us, I think, beginning. Um, child care was not looked at as education. Mm -hmm. We looked at as caregiver, babysitters, and all. But the more 
um, people understand that we need to update ourselves, um, do trainings, get um, college degrees. You have to get up to director one, two, uh, and even the family childcare. We have the um, levels, level one, two, three, up to four. So the more people are understanding, they start to get to many people stop, many, many people close their daycares because they couldn't cope. They didn't know how to just suddenly start doing more education stuff. They taught the children, but they didn't think that they have to be taught to. So mm -hmm. they didn't have to go to school again. Um, fortunately, when I said I lectured, I lectured in College of Education, so I taught teachers to go teach. So I love that. I love. I didn't know I'm gonna love the children more than mm -hmm. teaching adults. I love <laughs> the children. I roll with them on the floor. They love. <laughs> so what is um in my own situation directly? I my kids are spaced out. I have older one, 26. I have. The 21 was the last one, and we just got a year ago, we got a daughter, she's three. Mm -hmm. So I have to, and she wow. goes to any of the daycare that I'm working. Oh, okay. Ah. <laughs> so if I'm working Brockton, she's, that day she's a student she's there. Oh, okay. so she goes with me, so, and if there's no class where she can fit in in that school, she'll be taking her classes in my office, she'll be sitting there <laughs> with her stuff. So, those are some of the things, but it's definitely it's still um, hard for mothers mm -hmm. to do any organizing. Mm -hmm. And that's some of the reasons some people stay away because mm -hmm. they would just say, well, I think it's working now. Like I said, we have the, not just in person, we have the mixed, mm -hmm. we can do, we can do from home and enjoy it. Yeah. I think that's, I think today too, looks like this is not just only in person too. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 exactly. Yeah. Right. So Which you're is, organizing right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> this counts. Uh, I'm curious, as you are um, organizing with your coworkers, what, what, um, pitch for being in the union, for putting this extra time in when time is so precious, when you're trying to balance um, work and home life. What kinds of arguments or the, the um, just the way that you sell being in the union, what resonates? What do you find resonates the most, especially with colleagues who maybe are resistant at first? Mary, any thoughts on that? Like, what gets people? What do you, what can you say to your colleagues that sort of gets them and they and and they understand it and, and it helps them want to join with you? Well, what exactly what exactly are you using in my community? Mm -hmm. Because I like to work in my community yeah. is getting from my organizer the phone numbers, address, so like that I could call them and go and visit them. Uh -huh. Because sometimes they are need for something, for gloves, masks. So, mm -hmm. and then I have the library in East Boston, mm -hmm. that any information that we have in the union, anything that we have, that we talk in group. Mm -hmm. So I will, we will just get together with some groups and we let them know that we're going to be, so we have a meeting the second and Wednesdays uh -huh. in, the, in, in East Boston. So we will organize that day and they will come there and we will give them all the information. Uh -huh. So whosoever don't come, we will just try to reach them, uh -huh. calling them and stuff. So that's the kind of methods that um, uh -huh. we're doing, at least in my group uh -huh. from Chelsea, Rivera, East Boston, right. Worcester, and them kind of places that we'll be doing, organizing uh -huh. in that type of way, because you know, sometimes, and we do it online too. We do mm -hmm. through Zoom and stuff like that, because some people still don't want to come out. Yeah. So that's that's the way we we've been doing. Um, like I said previously, when I was with the system, um, we're not allowed to talk about it. But we had a group, a WhatsApp group, and everything about the you know I posted. Mm -hmm. And um, before I knew it, um, I, I became friendly with the director, one of the who monitored. I would send it to her, 
and she will post it and I'll post it. And it started, many people started being like um, getting most of the information. But what really got them this time, because I know somebody told me, oh, you're talking too much about this here. <laughs> <laughs> but when they saw my opening, um, the uh, ribbon cutting, they saw the mayor came, they saw Ayana, they saw oh. all those people. Everybody wanted to be in my new one. Oh, they want to come there. Like, mm. They remind me, oh, we didn't see you. Were you in that suit? I saw. I'm like, yeah, I was there. So they are happy. They see the wins and they believe that mm -hmm. um, they want to be part of this. So that got them. So our winnings. Yeah, success yeah. brings yeah. success, yeah. right? That's great. Uh, for us, uh, drivers are mostly confused. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. And it's it's harder for them uh, what is what. So everything they get online, so it's harder for them. What really gets them is they are in pain. So you're bringing here something to be heard. So it's easier, it is easier to get them, but they are at the same time confused. Uh, because Uber sends so many messages, sign a petition, they are going to take your flexibility. Mm -hmm. And and when we come and approach them, they will think that we are going to take their flexibility when we talk about union, they think they will be an employee, but we do say we still want to be flexible and have a union and have a bargain, to, uh, right uh, to bargain and also have a representation. That's all that matters, and they, it really gets them. Okay. Yeah. That's great. I think, like, that's besides that, also, you know, motivate, motivates them. And I, I tell them, like, we're making history right now. Mm -hmm. Like, if you don't fight for yourself, nobody's going to fight for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, like, <laughs> we are, yeah. if you want to be part of the history, the change that is going to occur, you know, like, then getting on board. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure if folks in the room have any questions, anything that anybody wants to, to raise. We have a few minutes left. It, Could keep going, but yes. I, I would put a question to Mary Kay. You're sitting here with this fabulous collection of women from the union. What, what unites all these stories for you? Well, when you think about what um, the home care workers have been able to achieve through collective bargaining, going from what you said, ten dollars, yeah, ten twenty-five, ten ten it, an hour for twenty-five, twenty-five dollars the pack, and now you're going, you're on a path to twenty-five dollars. Yes, and um, the child care providers are in a similar position. Yes, where minimum wages only. And now you have collective bargaining where you can. We, yeah, we got we got increases like every three months, and they say within yeah uh, three times we'll get this. I, I think we we moved from an infant pay paid for an infant being like six something seven to like um according at, like in Boston because we see our regions with little difference and to like a thousand three. Oh, wow. So there's been huge gains being made mm -hmm. in these two um, jobs mm -hmm. that used to be excluded yeah. from the ability to form unions and collectively bargain. Mm -hmm. That's what these two sisters want to do. Yes. They're not asking yes. for anything more. Yes. They're going to make happen in 2024 yes. what home care workers made happen, I think, in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. and child care providers in 2010, I Thousand, think, yeah. won the union here. Yeah. Yeah. And so now it's time for the 50,000 rideshare drivers. And guess who's standing in their way? Multinational corporations mm -hmm. who want to be able to turn off your, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. your app Apps. Your apps. Yeah. Yep. and uh, not allow you to drive. Mm -hmm. Yep or who's gonna not think about how do we think about what women are trying to manage mm -hmm. and how do we help have a collective bargaining process where women drivers could help deal with the challenges you mm -hmm. both described. And so 
we're careening towards a big problem here in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. where Uber and Lyft want to put a initiative on the ballot to block mm -hmm. the driver's ability to organize. And we are calling on the state legislature and Uber and Lyft to sit down with the drivers and uh, create legislation that allows them to do what home care and child care workers have uh, provided and sit at a collective bargaining table and bargain a better life for yourselves, your family, and all the clients. Of it, we would matter. Your bargaining would impact the passengers, just like you're impacting parents and children, mm -hmm. and you're impacting family members mm -hmm. and elders and people with mm -hmm. disabilities. And so, um, that's what ties it together for me, Michelle. Which is. The rideshare drivers, the entire labor movement needs to get behind, just like they did home care and child care, because it was racism and sexism that excluded this work mm -hmm. from the beginning. And I would argue, I don't know if you agree, racism and sexism are at play mm -hmm. in how drivers are very much at play, yes. right? Yes. On how drivers are being treated, mm -hmm. uh, not just in Massachusetts, but around the country. Around the country. Thank you for that. Michelle, did you have a question? Yeah, I wanted to get a little. <laughs> <laughs> so this is really for Betty and Daniela. Earlier, Mary and I were talking about you know what she wanted at the bargaining table, and she talked to me about getting these six days off for holidays and getting vacation, and then the twenty-five dollars an hour, which is not so bad. And I want to know what would you do with that time. How would you spend that time if you had that kind of time off and that kind of stability and security in your lives? Oh my God, it's, it's, it's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, with the kids, they, they, they are an investment for us. Mm -hmm. It's So I have an 11 and an 8 and a 5 year old. It's a busy house. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all about family. They are taking that time out now. We work 60 to 70 hours and we barely are like zombies at home mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's it's so stressful job at yep. the same time. Well, um, definitely with the kids <laughs> and definitely, you know, for myself to to have some rest to offer a better version of myself to my kids. You know, every time they ask you like, mommy, can you read this story for me? Can you know? Can you play with me? And sometimes we're too tired, or like we have to manage that time to make some laundry or you know cook the food for next day. And definitely, yeah, spend more time for, with the family. All right. Kind of a basic human right. If you're <laughs> <laughs> yeah, human right. Yeah. 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 And one you would think we could all agree on that yes. it yeah. should be a part of everybody's life, but mm -hmm. apparently we gotta we gotta we you, you all are putting in the work to get us from here to there. We probably have time for one more round of questions. And Mary Kay, I want to come back to you to start, but I really want to hear from all of you. So you are all working so hard um, to to move these organizing rights forward to continue to uh, use the organizing rights that, that you have to make life better. Like, what's the dream? What does it look like? What does success look like? And I feel like this is a particularly opportune moment <laughs> to ask you, Mary uh -oh. Kay, as you, as you have brought SEIU so far towards that dream. Yeah. So what does it look, what is, what is that definition of success look well, like? Well, every home care worker in America, Canada, and Puerto Rico would be able to achieve what you've achieved. Yes. And so that means 2 million more home care workers have to have the ability to join a union and bargain. Mm -hmm. And that would inspire the 2 million child care providers mm -hmm. to win what you've won, but also to win more for both. Mm -hmm. Because home care and child care providers need the power to convince the federal government to put a lot more money That's true. in this kind of care that we want to value as a nation and that right now, isn't valued. I was talking to the UAW president recently about what they won in their strike. And he said, there's no reason why home care and child care workers shouldn't earn as much as auto workers 
the only reason is because they were written out of the law at the very beginning and didn't have the right to form unions and you've had to fight state by state by state and you haven't been able to fight across the country and then imagine four million dynamic women <laughs> pumping along that's going to make it possible for the five million people yes. who are doing gig work mm -hmm. to be able to form a national union and make uber and lyft sit down at a national bargaining table let's get it done because starbucks just got it done why can't you so then now we've just added two four five nine million more workers being able to collectively bargain and then why not amazon why can't we finally get Amazon warehouse workers? You know what I mean? So I, my dream is that each of these struggles where there's a breakthrough, like I can't imagine that Uber and Lyft aren't worried that Starbucks workers just won, mm -hmm. right? And that they're going to have a foundational agreement statewide. And I can't imagine that McDonald's and Burger King aren't sitting back and saying, okay, well, they fast food workers are going to a table in California, a half million. Why not the other four million that do fast food work in this country? So that's my dream. Right. Yeah. Danielle, tell me, so, so in our dream futures, you're setting up the collective bargaining table with mm. Uber and Lyft. Mm -hmm. What do you put, what's your dream of what you would put on the table in those collective bargaining negotiations to win? Well, the, you know, to be on considerations, um, women's need on the job um, that are totally different than the men's need. And also fair payments, mm -hmm. you know, because we are mostly doing all the job and getting all the expenses. And um, I think that's <laughs> some, some that's of them like to, to resume. <laughs> Yeah, on an addition, I can yeah. add. Well, more. yes, Betty, what would you what would yeah. you add? What else are you yeah. putting on the table? The worst nightmare for now for the for drivers is deactivation. Mm -hmm. So, like seeing the union pass, mm -hmm. have someone representing us is like the dual process of how they deactivate people, the drivers. One is that, and also bargaining the fair pay is the other one and of course having all those sick leaves and all the benefits that a union can offer us is a really a big 360 degree change for a driver mm -hmm. <laughs> great you have collective uh, bargaining what's the what's the next frontier what what um, are you putting on the table in your um, next negotiation i think for me um we've had um i think we're working on it already but Having, like, um, we have a, when you get a license for family child care, you get, um, one, the, the um, educator gets six children. And then when you get to get 10 children, they expect you eight or 10, they expect you to have a teacher who you're going to pay and pay the bills, pay them um, everything for the children. And we are giving a maximum of 10. So mm -hmm. we're hoping, I think California has that. They have 12 when they have two teachers. Mm -hmm. So we hope we'll be able to achieve that and also be able to have life insurance, mm -hmm. uh, health, health insurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, important one. Mary, what are you putting on the table in your dream well, negotiations? Well, my dream negotiation, we had, I didn't say all about what we win this year. So yeah, you're living we, your dreams. Because so we already we win insurance. <laughs> so we're going to have we win the insurance, we win the vacations. So we have 50 hour vacation. Plus we have if we can go it's like a, we have a friend that he take care of a lady so he can go vacation. So uh -huh. he could get a vacation in December, but he could just cash it out. So he could stay with the money and he could still take care of his client. So we win that. Some more flexibility. Yeah, so we win too. So no, the government give us, if we finish all the 12 classes, we could get $1,000 to finish the 12 classes mm -hmm. for us. So we win too. 
two holidays. Mm -hmm. We were asking for four, mm -hmm. but we were going for the next, yeah. in three years, we uh -huh. were going for the next one. <laughs> so we win Martin Luther King and Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. So, wow. we that. so that's a good win-win for us. So we have yeah. six holidays to win. We, we have six holidays now. We were so happy to do that. So, we win a lot of stuff. <laughs> so we have a lot of things to win, but how I am too in the international team from ACIU. Mm -hmm. So what I really want to suggest, so I will be suggesting that for new foreign in the ACIU team international is like, I really would love that all the state be unilized. Yes, yes. yes. All the state. Because it's yeah. like, Without the union, we can't do nothing. That's Without right. the union, we don't have no voice. So yes. we definitely need a union in every state. And no Massachusetts is a union state. Yeah. So we can move that and let's fight, making mm -hmm. nobody take but it away Alabama, from us. Mississippi, yeah. All of them, Georgia. they need it. Everybody. All yes. Of we need union in all the states. Yeah. So yeah. that's my dream, union for all the states. Well, that is an inspiring <laughs> I want to add yeah. um, is needed. We actually won a lot of things. I just summarized the pay a little, but we won holidays um, time off. We won, um, I think we want some kind of insurance, health insurance, but it's given to us in card. We have the I card. Mm -hmm. okay. So the money is put in there, but um, it's not enough thing go around mm -hmm. everybody. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was asking for. Well, I want to thank you all, every one of you, for this inspiring conversation. It does give me faith and hope that we will get to those dreams that we just heard about, especially yeah. with women at the forefront of this <laughs> organizer, I'm just going to say. So thank you so much for being here with us and sharing your stories and your hard work and your inspiration. And really thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I forget one important one. Yes. That when we were in COVID, COVID not gone yet, but in COVID, we, you know, some, we were working still. Mm -hmm. So when you go in the street, we didn't have no ID. So we win that with the state. Because we, I tell them straight, you can't go, you can't go into the state without having ID. Mm -hmm. So we need an ID. So now we will have an ID, so we win. So every caregiver will have an ID for the need to see their oh, clients. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So that's a win-win. <laughs> And thanks to Sharon and Michelle for hosting us. Our this was really wonderful. Yeah. Happy Women's Michelle. Month, everybody. Yeah,